You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. Rock the boat. Don't rock the boat, baby. Rock the boat. Don't tip the boat over. Rock the boat. Don't rock the boat, baby. Rock the boat. You have no idea how long we practiced that. Way too long. <laughs> and now it's finally time to get into the episode itself. Oh boy, I really hope we don't include those three minutes of rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. So... You going to rock the boat today? We're not going to rock the boat. Maybe a little. If, if you haven't heard, something was announced by Sheldon Menery and the Rules Committee for Commander, and it's that there is going to be a new group called the Commander Advisory Group. CAG, for short. C-A-G. Yeah, the CAG. And... Spoiler alert, I am one of the CAG members. I accepted a position on the CAG, on the Commander Advisory Group. Congratulations, Josh. Thank you. You are a big deal now. <laughs> <laughs> so the CAG is not part of the Rules Committee. It's a it's a consulting gig, basically. It's an, an advisory, advisory group, role. Yeah. yeah, so they are going to sort of talk to the members of this group and use them to increase their perspective, get a little more of a broader look at maybe what's going on out there in the world of commanders so that they can get those opinions and take them to an account when they make their rulings, Mm -hmm. bannings, rules changes, things like that. Also, one of the goals of the CAG is more transparency for the rules committee. So they chose a bunch of people in the content creation world Mm -hmm. so that we can kind of like, you know, let everybody out there know what's going on, what decisions were made and why. So... That's it's a it's a big thing. Who knows at this moment how big of a deal? Like if I say we should do this, there's a good chance they they just do not even listen at all. But they so, did hear you. But they did hear me. Um, so yeah, we're. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. Uh, either yeah. way, we're interested to see where that's going. That's what today's episode is going to be about. Talking about a few things about Commander, what might need to get fixed, what should be fixed, and things that maybe Josh here will be bringing up with the Commander Advisory Committee. Yeah, I think group. if I was out there, and I'm wondering this about the other members of the of the CAG also, is like, what is everybody's views? Since those people's views are going to be like one step removed from the Rules Committee, right? it's kind of, I think, important to know, well, what are they going to be representing? What are they going to be advocating for? And of course, this being our show, we can at least tell you what mine are. And yes. you know, honestly... Jimmy and I, we've been talking about Commander for four, Three, four, four years. years now, an hour a week. You know, we've kind of codified our own philosophies, and they're very similar. So, Which is why they only needed Josh and not me on this thing. You know what I mean? This boy busy. Where's the next movie at, yo? Uh, just kidding. Anyway, uh, as we go through the episode, start formulating in your head as well what you think might uh, you might bring up to the Commander Advisory Committee, the group, CAG, all that stuff. Before we get into it, though... The one thing I wanted to bring up is that I'm not on keg, but I'm not hurt because I can still play commander with the best of them by buying my cards from the best of them. That's right, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. You're going to buy cards anyway. Why not do it and do it in a way that supports the show? And hey, look, now there is a tangible reality to the impact this show has on our format. Um, and you know, you guys being a part of that community and using this affiliate link helps us out in every way. This Harbor is floating all the ships and it's rising them, raising them equally. Yeah. And, uh, Ravnica Allegiance yeah. just came out. So if you want to get a hold of your smothering tithes for all of your white decks, or maybe just all of your decks, then mm-hmm. yeah, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Also, when you pick up those cards, you probably want ways to protect them, deck boxes to put them in, play mats to play on. If you use Ultra Pro for all of that stuff, A, you'll be using the best of the best, the best products that are out there to protect your cards and bling out your battlefield. But B, you'll also be supporting this show through supporting our sponsors. We really appreciate everybody that does that. Does that. And the final way, and to me the most important way to get involved, in fact, part of this topic was inspired by the people in our Patreon. That's right, patreon.com slash command zone. That's the way you can support the show in the most direct way. We do one thing where we call it a lucky patron every single week. And this week, that person is John Vogel. John, Thanks. you rock. Yep. And uh, by, by I said our Patreon participating in our Discord, Josh posted the question, what would you guys like to see addressed to the CAG? And it was great seeing everyone's responses. A lot of it lined up with what we had already been thinking. So that was cool. It's nice to see a lot of perspectives too, to take the temperature. And, you know, you read things and you're like, hmm, that's something people are worried about. It's good to know. 
because every play group's different. And so I think that's another advantage of the commander advisory group, which is that just access not only to us, but our communities. Right. And the command zone one is one of the best there is. Our patrons are sweet. Uh, okay, we're going to go into the main topic. But before we do, if you weren't aware, the new Game Nights just came out last week. Bingo. It's been out for a couple of days now. If you haven't seen it, definitely should go check it out. It's a pretty great game. Also, at the end of it... Paradox Engine, powerful. (laughs) The episode is Paradox Engine, good. And uh, at the end of it, of course, we are giving away stuff. So you have one week from what would be last Friday to enter. So make sure you enter. Also, we've got something kind of cool going on for a future episode of Game Nights. Oh, yeah, that's right. So right now, if you follow us on Twitter, we are putting out a poll. This is the first time we've ever done something like this. We've announced um, who the guests for that episode are going to be. It's going to be Kenji, Numata Namiyagashira, and Rachel Agnes, who is coincidentally also on the Commander Advisory Group. Very cool. It's funny because we booked her for this episode before we even knew that. I was going to call insider trading, but yeah. (laughs) It's just a coincidence. (laughs) It was a coincidence. But the cool thing is what we're doing is we're, we're kind of theming the episode as like a Ravnica Guild showdown showdown yeah Yeah. like which guild is the best and you can go and follow the link the link through our twitter and it takes you to a poll and you get to basically vote on which guild each of us should play yeah that's right this is direct audience participation in the outcome of what's going to be on the final episode of game nights you get to vote which guild do you think josh should play kenji rachel myself and submit that vote and also we're doing a prize giveaway associated with it for which is some swag and stuff around the ravnica theme stuff if you enter your email as well before you vote there's only one vote per household but we've never done this before you guys are going to get to choose what guild every single player on the show is going to play yeah simic that's for me i am boros. definitely giving you rakdos again boros for jimmy i only Do get one not vote give me boros <laughs> oh don't give me boros please but if you won so much bragging rights. How many smothering tithes can I put in my also, deck? Also, if you... W- yeah, one. Uh, only one. Sorry. Oh, darn. If you did win the game with Boros... It would be a legendary moment. First of all, I would never hear the end of it because I trash talk <laughs> Boros so much. They'd be like, see, I it's trash awesome. talk Boros yeah, too. True. We would both never hear the end Give of it. Give Kenji or Rachel Boros, please. Yeah. Or no one. <laughs> I don't, should we be even like trying to affect... Vote for whatever guild yeah, you think Yeah, vote for whatever. In uh, fact, if awesomest. anything, I just sealed my fate and made more people vote Boros. But honestly, there's 10 guilds and four players. So some guilds, wink, wink are going to get left in the dust. (laughs) You got it? (laughs) Don't worry about it. Okay. Let us go on to the main topic here. Hold on, hold on. I need to type out the time code that this starts at because... (laughs) And also include the note that you missed the part where you learned you can affect the outcome of Of game game nights. nights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. So the goal today here is... and, And the goal, I think, for our show and for me as part of the Commander Advisory Group is always going to be to be as transparent as possible. Yeah, full disclosure. Yeah, so our dealings with the CAG and the Rules Committee are always going to be whatever I can talk about, I will let you guys know about. One of the requirements for me even joining the group when they asked me to was, listen, I can't do it if I'm not going to be able to still dissent, disagree with what you guys ultimately decide to do, and if I can't talk about it on my show, because I'd much rather be able to comment on those things and still have our podcast be the same than, than be like, restricted from doing that and they were like no oh, no no yeah, no no absolutely. yeah that was my only concern too which is like does this make you like a reporter for something like do you have to up your hold yourself to different like no we're st- with this podcast remains the same yeah that was the first thing that i asked and they they, they cleared that up right away uh You're that, not a in, sellout Josh. in fact in fact being transparent was like i said one of the reasons they even chose certain people like me f- to, to be on the committee. They they yeah. do want to be able to get the word out there about what they're doing, why, and what the process is. Yeah, I think they recognize too, because Shivam's on here, that the the podcast community is one that has a voice yep. and obviously has should have, you know, it's a large voice in terms of getting data. One of the things we always harped on the RC about was they didn't have enough data. Right. And going to two podcasts for two of the members here, I think is the right way to go at least. Yeah, so let's just talk really quickly about the other members of the CAG. Uh, as you said, Shivam Butt, who is one of the co-hosts of the Commander in podcast, along with Phil DeLuca, mm-hmm. friend of the show. He also friend provides of ours. a cultural perspective as well, as they noted when they declared all the members. Yep. Uh, there's Stibbs, Stiborski. Yep. Adam Stiborski is he, also yep. prior guest on the show. Yep. Been on our show. Friend of ours. Have played Commander with him a few times at GPs. Mm-hmm. Those are the only two that I personally know, that we personally know. Same. Now, Rachel Agnes is somebody that... Uh, We've corresponded a little bit with and is going to be on Game Nights upcoming, obviously. Uh, but I don't actually know Rachel 
like we haven't hung out or anything mm-hmm. before, so I've never met her in person, but have exchanged a, exchanged a number of emails. Uh, Ron Foster and Charlotte Sable are the last two members, and I don't know them at all. Yep. Um, me neither. Yeah, so. But Sheldon does. And if you guys look at the announcement, they'll, he has a list of the things that they've done as well. So you can see where exactly they came from. And I'm sure a lot of you viewers and listeners out there recognize those names. Yeah, so that's a good point. In the show notes for this episode in the more info box below the video, we'll have a link to the article that Sheldon released that sort of explains exactly what the commander advisory group is, who's on it, you know, who all the people that are on it sort of are and how he knows them and why they mm-hmm. were chosen. Um Let's see. Let's see. I think all the members that I know, Stibbs, Shivam, are good choices. Rachel, I know, is kind of she's written for Channel Fireball about Commander, and she oh, cool. she writes a little bit about the competitive side of EDH sometimes. So she's involved in that aspect of it a little bit. So that's a perspective I think that is good. We have published authors, published podcasters. Yes. Uh, and one thing some people have been asking me is how well acquainted I am and we are with the people on the rules committee. So Sheldon was on our show once, uh, mm-hmm. a little bit contentious. It was right after the tuck rule got right, changed. Right, on my and, birthday. Yep. And <laughs> and then uh, at PAX last year, Jimmy and I got were involved in an event that Sheldon was at. Mm-hmm. So we got to meet him, but we didn't actually play any games with him. Um, yep. Somebody that we've obviously corresponded with over Twitter and things. Uh, Gavin Dugan, who is another Rules Committee member I've met once. He was at our commander party in... Um, 2017 the big one in vegas Mm -hmm. he came up and introduced himself and was pretty wowed by the fact that we had like 600 commander players in a room playing you you made this happen (laughs) (laughs) um scott larrabee i also know he works at wizards of the coast and he's their representative on the rules committee side yep yeah and scott was also uh at that event where we played with sheldon and then the last one is toby elliott and i don't know toby i've never met toby so yeah, and I would say my knowledge of these people is actually pretty limited. Honestly, I, I know the name Sheldon Menory. I've read articles. We've met him a couple of times. He's been on the show once, uh, and then Scott as well. But the other two, I, I, you know, outside of a passing, hey, how's it going? You don't really get to know someone that well at events and stuff. It's it's a bit tougher. Yeah, Sheldon, of course, uh, used to be a very high up judge. Had worked on a ton of pro tours. That's and, right. Yeah, kind of the godfather of the format. I like to say popularized commander. Okay, so today we're going to s- discuss my current thinking on many of the most talked about possible changes, fixes that people want to see in the format. And that way you can get an idea of where my head's at when I might be advocating for or talking to the rules committee about. Um, it'll also give you a chance if you disagree to, you know, tweet at know. us, email, comment, you know, with your own perspective, because that's the, really the thing I think is important is just getting a lot of perspective from people out there. And if a lot of people are clamoring for something, there's a good chance that it's like, oh, maybe we need to look at it or maybe right. I need to be pushing or advocating for it. Yes, but please keep it civil. Yes. Um, We're fighting for commander rules, not like human rights here, so. <laughs> right. Uh, right. And Jimmy and I do agree on a lot of things. In fact, a lot of my opinions are shaped by things we've talked about. So we have a lot of the same perspective, but Jimmy may play devil's advocate a little bit yes. today just to sort of... The double-edged sword, Josh. I know your weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might give us a clearer idea on why, you know, my opinion on certain things is the way that it is. So let's talk about the big one that I got. As soon as this was announced, a lot of people on Twitter were... I don't, uh, hope, this is the one. This is the hill jokingly, that you're going. Yeah, jokingly, but maybe some of them weren't uh, asking me about commander yeah. damage. So in the commander summit, I think a couple years ago... I had just sort of brought up as a topic like don't how, like it don't need it how useful is commander right. damage to the format you know is it good is it bad and I, I came down on the side of like i think co- commander damage is ultimately kind of like mana burn mm-hmm. it comes up very very rarely in games it's complicated most well, mana burn never comes up in games yeah. but <laughs> commander damage obviously comes up more than mana burn but it it's it's rare that it matters in a game i see it um it's complicated. A lot of people don't even understand that, A, it's only combat damage. Get this all the time. Mm-hmm. That people think, like, Nekusar is going to kill you with 21 commander damage by, like, right. drawing 21 Pinging cards. cards. No, yeah. it's no, only no, commander, no, damage. commander damage. Also, combat people, damage. people yeah. don't understand that it doesn't stack. Like, if Jimmy attacks me with his commander and then Mel attacks me with her commander, those commander damages are tracked separately. So Jimmy might have hit me for two and Mel for four. Well... I don't have six commander damage. I have two from Jimmy's commander and four from Mel's. A bit confusing. I agree there. It also gets kind of a pain in the butt to track when you've got 
partner commanders and all kinds of things going on and you got to keep your life total maybe your poison amount and then two or three different commanders also there's weird things that can happen whereas if i like steal jimmy's commander Mm -hmm. and then hit mel with it then if if jimmy had previously hit mel with that same commander before then that will stack because the commander damage is actually tied to the physical card yep so my point during the summit was commander damage is overly complex and if I were redesigning the format, I would not include it. Hi, Josh. Command Zone Podcast here. Yeah. You've been on record for saying that you dislike this uh, and you want it removed. Why are you trying to remove fun from a game? <laughs> why do you hate fun, Josh? Uh, I, I'm not on record as saying I want it removed. So, Josh, why do you want You are now on record. You just said I want it removed in context <laughs> to this statement. All right. I'm not going to play hardball, but I think the thing to the the other point here would be what's so hard about just clarifying how the rules work if people are confused about it yeah i i i I mean my point is like i wouldn't actually take commander damage away at this point Mm -hmm. it was more of a talking point of like i don't like it and i agree with all the things i said i think those are all true but the thing that overrides all of it is that like commander's been around for a long time Mm -hmm. there's a way that it's used to being played and stuff has been designed with commander damage in mind so the voltron strategy even though I still think, even with Voltron out there, very, very rarely does commander damage decide a game. I think a lot of times when you die to commander damage, you are also going to die to regular damage. I see. It's still entrenched enough in the format that I just don't th- actually think it's worth it to remove it. It will just cause too much upheaval. So I, I'm not, I will not be advocating to the rules committee to get rid of commander damage. Okay. So now that your stance has been set that you want to permanently get rid of commander damage. <laughs> don't do that because people will totally... <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, okay, so here's the thing. Here... I, because I think commander damage, in essence, is a more casual way of going about the format. It's it, even just looking at it from like a holistic top-down perspective. It's like, oh yeah, you want to hit big, smashy, hard with t- one creature yeah. enough to just really ice them out of the game. Um, and I, for me, when I came into the game, I think that was actually a fun flavor win for me. This is a game about your commander, and if anything, the the decks that watsi has been releasing and the way that the mechanics have been working is that decks are really formulated to be built around your commanders. Right. So I think getting rid of commander damage is, of course, nothing that either of us want to have happen, but where do you propose we do fix the things to either make it more clear, or do you think it needs to be refined, or do you think do we could even add in new rules so that instead of like, all right, if you do 50 damage with your commander total, then you can do something, you know, it's like, or do you want to f- keep it the way it is? 21, that's the sweet number. A, I think keep it the way it is is totally fine. But if I were going to make a change, I think the change that is the easiest and makes the most sense is to just remove all the complexity with keeping track of multiple commanders. Mm-hmm. Just make it like poison damage. You can take 21 commander damage. But if Jimmy hits me for two and Mel hits me for four, I have six commander damage. I see. And maybe that simplifies it to the point. Maybe that number needs to increase then because 21 from three different players means just seven per, right? So it's still, I bet it rarely happens, but yeah, sure. Maybe it needs to increase already though. It's like 21 is such a random number and it's, it's a lot. Like it's only, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times it's like one big creature swings at you, but right. it hits you for 35. Like you were going to die anyway. The, the damage, the, the, the 21 part doesn't matter that much. True. Um, I just think that the I, that Voltron decks do have their upsides and downsides, yeah. and it's very easy, I think, to stop a Voltron deck in a lot of different decks, yep. de- especially Edicts and all that stuff. But I think that does provide a bit of a challenge because I think the number one complaint that we do see is that games don't end fast enough. So if there is a way, and the way that you're proposing would definitely make it faster if it's just 21 cumulative, that potentially is something does that we could Does it feel like in. Voltron decks or commander damage-based decks, ones that are trying to kill you by hitting you with their commander, are too strong now? No, they've never been strong. Maybe they've never been strong enough. Right, so, so the stacking the commander damage thing might just make them viable for real. I think it would require a probably pretty extensive testing to see because I could see some games... The, again, I think the number one thing people want to avoid are feel bads. Right. And the only current feel bad that you seem to be pointing out here is that it's just hard to understand how commander damage works and how to track it in a lot of the edge case scenarios. It's a pain in the butt. And you're saying that commander damage already is enough of an edge case scenario that it's an edge case scenario with its own edge case scenarios and no one wants the that. The juice is just not worth the squeeze to me. But again, I want to be very clear. My... I don't even think I'm going to uh, advocate for the stacking of commander damage. That's just the, the the only change I could see that maybe makes sense. But for me, right. let's just leave commander damage as it is. It's entrenched in the format, and it's totally fine. Like, it's a little bit complicated. I don't mm-hmm. love it, but at the same time, 
it's, it's, it's totally fine. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, it's not it's not it's not a hill that I'm willing to stand or die on. <laughs> All right. So let's find that hill. Shall we move on to the next topic? Yeah, let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> All right, don't worry, I won't falsely accuse you of anything at this uh, point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Planeswalkers as Commanders. So Brawl, as a lot of you know, is a 60-card format based on the standard rotation. They just made it open that every single Planeswalker that's released within standard can also be our commander for the Brawl format. This, however, has not made it into the full-on commander sets, except for in the product that they released where it specifically says that this card can be your commander. Yeah, so like Aminatu, Sahili, right. the most recent commander set. Yep, as well as the original one with Teferi and all those guys. The monocolored well. ones, monocolor yeah. Monocolored ones, yeah. So the community, there seems like there's been a push just to, hey, why don't we make all Planeswalkers legal in commander? What do you think, Josh? Yeah, I, I'm on record as saying that I don't like this. I I don't love Planeswalkers as commanders. The ones they have released, like this year and the previous years, anytime you play with those, it feels like they add to the game length um, for a number of reasons. Because A, Planeswalkers are kind of life gain spells, right? Because other players tend to attack them instead right. of the player, the player. So they're not lowering life totals. They're attacking Planeswalkers. And then B, the Planeswalker itself is not a creature that can attack, so that's less damage just being done in a game. Yeah, all that commander damage. Yeah. <laughs> not even that. Like, yeah. To go back to the commander damage thing, like, let's say I play Rune. Mm -hmm. Rune often chips in for 12, 16 damage in a game, right? He's vigilant. He can attack pretty right. easily. No, he's not doing it to one player necessarily. It's just like, oh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Jimmy's open or he only has a 2-2. Two -two. I hit him then a couple turns later, oh, something happened and now I can get in at Mel for a couple. Right. And and that like lowers 16 points of damage in a game is a decent amount. It's going to change the uh, amount of time that that game takes, right? Yep. yep. Whereas You're right. if there's a Planeswalker I'm playing with, A, I didn't do that 16 points of damage and B, I probably didn't take the damage because I had to attack Mel's Planeswalker or I had to attack Jimmy's Planeswalker and so like it compounds in two different directions. To, so to me, that creates uh, an average game length that is longer by a significant amount. I, I don't think it's like a minute or two. I think we're adding, you know, five, six minutes maybe per Planeswalker. That's so my, a lot. My question to you then is there historically haven't really been that many Planeswalkers that have been released that are actual viable commanders. Right. If that makes sense. Um my question to you here then is, do you think it's really going to make more players unhappy than it will make new players that want to build around these cards happier? Like the overall happy quotient with Magic, with Commander specifically, like do you think it's actually better to not have this happen because of the potential? And again, this is untested data, right? We don't know exactly how long it makes games, but the potential of making certain games longer, because it's not like you're only having Planeswalkers as Commanders here, right? Right, right. Um, is that better than just denying people the ability to brew around these cards? Well, A, I would say you would have a ton of Planeswalkers as commanders at first, mm -hmm. right? As soon as they make that legal, you're looking at six months of like half of your games are going to be half Planeswalkers probably because people are going to be like, or at least I think at least one is more reasonable because I think a lot of people still love their cards. And it, that's the, my other thing about this is I don't think there are that many Planeswalkers that are that exciting and fun to build around outside of more of like a, hey, this is cool. I can finally do this. So I'm going to. People, yeah, exactly. But they're going to try it. I mean, it, if you looked at say how many games right now you're playing that feature a legendary creature that was printed in the last year. Mm -hmm. It's going to be high. It's right. probably half of the commanders in all your games. That's the way people operate. They New stuff comes out, they build the thing. You know, you see a ton of Lord Windgraces and Nicol Boluses and the new stuff, and then you see some of the older stuff sprinkled in. Well, as soon as you do that, the Planeswalkers become the new stuff. You're going to see a ton for a little bit, I think. And, and the, listen, the slow game thing, that's like one point, one reason against it. Mm -hmm. The biggest reason against it, I actually think, is just that the commander format's in a really good place. It's the most popular format. When we started our podcast, Jimmy, it was like a niche thing. There was no other podcast we could find even talking about it. How, oh. how many podcasts about commander are there now? Eight, nine, ten like there's, shows. There's so many. How many YouTube channels about commander are oh, there? Oh, plenty. Yeah, there was zero yeah. when we started. And so the growth of the format is so big. And so to me, that's the biggest thing. And to go back to our song at the beginning of the episode is... Don't rock the boat. Yeah, why do we want to risk it? Like, you might be right. There might only be a couple of Planeswalkers that are, like, really viable as strong decks. But we don't know. And why? Why, when you're so far ahead in the game, do you not just, like, keep playing the way that got you there? I th my argument with that would be, I don't think it really is going to destabilize the format 
in a, in a significant way. Now, some of the other things we're going to talk about would potentially destabilize the format. I think this is just one of those, those things that is, seems harmless enough on the surface that I think deserves at least some small period of time or active testing by someone in the CAG to see, hey, exactly, you know, is this good or not? And But more importantly, the question here to me is, are there going to be more people... I can see this being something that younger fans really appreciate, being like, cool, I can play my Planeswalker in Commander. And if Brawl is sort of like the way to take someone from standard to standard Commander to regular Commander, it would does kind of feel bad that the Planeswalkers that you built around in, in Brawl can't be used for Commander there. Yeah, so I mean, I, that, something, that... something in me says that the actual hurt of the format is people that may have wanted to build around something and learning, oh, darn, I can't. But I don't know how big that number is as opposed to what the potential risk of quote unquote destabilizing things is either. I mean, to address the brawl thing, I don't, that's, I don't like that argument at all because I don't think brawl should be dictating to command or anything. No, oh, I don't think it's dictating. I think you're just potentially losing players that might be like, oh, cool, I want to build a commander deck, but I can't actually use this planeswalker as my commander anymore. Why? Why can't I? But that's a choice that Brawl made that forces something into Commander saying like, oh, so we should do this thing now because Brawl did it? I mean, I think if anything, Brawl showed that it's not something that's disastrous. Brawl also showed there's not something that's popular because nobody plays Brawl. Yeah, but regardless, I think if there was some larger, if there was a lesson, because if you're looking at case studies, right, if you're going to try and right. study anything, you have a perfect case study there where you can well, at least Brawl look actually, and see what happens. But the, all the games of Brawl we played, which granted, I probably played a dozen, maybe seven games of Brawl, they're long. Because of the planeswalkers and because I the think power they were long because the power level wasn't high. Enough. Well, I think the the planeswalkers compounds that though. So sure, I, there's nothing about having planeswalkers as commanders in brawl that I thought, boy, I really want to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, did it up the fun quotient? I would say for the people building their decks, it might. But that's the thing is that it's a very uh, subjective thing overall. Because me personally, I don't have very much interest in playing these planeswalkers, but I know a lot of people that do. And for a lot of people, that's fun for them as for in terms of flavor. It's fun for them in terms of playing their favorite characters and all that stuff. So I can see why people would want it. I'm just wondering if the actual impact of it happening is as significant as you're placing it to be, which I don't actually think it is. Yeah, I just don't see very much upside. I've never... And, and listen... People out there could have tried it and been like, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. But every time that Planeswalkers get thrown in the mix, and we've seen enough of it with the monocolored Planeswalkers, the new ones this year, Brawl. Mm -hmm. It's not like I've never played in games where commanders are the uh, command, or sorry, where Planeswalkers are the commanders, right? I've experienced it. And every time I've been like, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's good. I don't like it. It doesn't add to the fun quotient. If it did, I might be more in favor of it. But for me, there's not really a big upside. I think people think they want it. People think like, oh, it'd be awesome. I'll have, but I don't, it's like as the, I'm not on the rules committee, but as, you know, people in charge of the format, what people think they want, you have to kind of predict what will actually be fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it actually will. I mean, a six-year-old the thinks thing they want to eat cotton candy for dinner every night, but you know, they shouldn't, right? <laughs> Is that the main thing that you think stay, takes away from the fun then? It's just a longer game? No, no, I and also. The, and the fact that they can't chip in for damage kind of thing? Oh, no, no, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's a big potential downside. Like it. Mm -hmm. That's I actually I think that's an actual downside. Then you compound that with the potential downside of that's a lot of new cards coming into the format all at once. We don't know what that'll do. Like there could be some really broken ones. Like the worst thing ever would be like they do this and then they have to ba ban like three or four of them. Well, then why not ban them before you? Because you don't know. It? Well, isn't that part of what the advisory committee and all you guys are supposed to be doing here? Which is like, yes, if you were to do this, here's what he, here's but who you would suggest. But I don't think suggest. there's any way to predict it, right? That's that's be like looking at the set the set review or the uh, card image gallery for Ravnica Allegiance and being like, we should ban these four cards. Now I can say Vanifar looks very powerful, Smothering Tithe very powerful, but I right. don't. I would. Would you want the rules committee going like before the cards even come out? I Vanifar would, is banned. I think it would be easy to do for Planeswalkers looking in retrospect and then letting any new Planeswalker come in let it be legal and then addressing them on the one because again I, out of the current like realm of planeswalkers maybe one or two would be worthy of looking at like should they allow this to actually be played as a commander and that's my thing is like you're doing the thing where you're predicting rather than waiting to see what happened and right. i'd rather wait to see what happened but i'm but interested to see how many times the rules committee has not needed to wait to see what happens like when the game first started was there a small ban list 
I have no idea about that, honestly. No. That's that's yeah. something I'd be interested to see. I mean, in they've as been well. playing for years unofficially, so that well, that's I think. That's the thing. I think it's just pretty obvious if something's going to be actually busted out the gate in terms of a commander. I don't think so. It took Profit the Crufix like a year and a half. Paradox Engine is still legal. We There's tons knew, of we stuff. We all knew Profit the Crufix need to go. The old was there for a while. Out. There was car- There's been cards that got banned like years after, so they had to see it for a while to decide that it was banned. Not that I agree with the entire ban list, and we'll get that to that in a minute. But I don't think that it would be good at all to like just look at a list never see the cards as commanders played and just be like i think these three should be banned i would much rather be like let's see let's see what happens okay so you do want to have the planes no, see you're doing the thing okay excellent. you're doing the thing excellent excellent moving on no okay okay so what's your final stance on planeswalkers as commanders i'm just not in favor of it i just don't think there's enough upside to make it worth it i'm not saying that there wouldn't be some people that are happy with it but i think in general mm-hmm. it's just the juice is not worth the squeeze it's just it's a big risk for little upside and I even, and, and the potential downside mixed with the actual we know there will be a long lengthening of games. Okay. It's just, uh, yeah, no. All right. I would say for the final devil's advocate that there is not enough proof that it actually would lengthen a significant number of games to in, to decrease overall unhappy uh, to decrease overall happiness with the format. Well, give me, me, might have give like me a the argument spurt. give me the argument for it shortens games. Oh, it doesn't shorten games, okay, I don't so. think. Well, it doesn't necessarily, but that's what I'm saying is like, is is a long game the worst part about this game? You just said in, you just said in the in the previous section no, no, about what, commander damage that one of the benefits of it was that it shortens it, games. It does and, help. and the whoa, biggest whoa, whoa, wait wait the oh. biggest You know I have to play Devil's Advocate know, differently no. for all of these, right? I can't I just be the same person across all of them. It's impossible. <laughs> I agree with too much of your stuff. I can't be like, ugh. Okay. It's a very hard position to take right now, the devil's true, advocate. True. Okay. Stuff. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I think there should be ways to end games quickly. Right. If you have a planeswalker as your commander, that doesn't mean you don't have some two card combo in there that will end the game on the well, spot. Right. All the right. green ones have doubling season. Another reason why well, I wouldn't want to do it. Not just doubling season. Well, that that is something that's see that is an actual argument I think that we should have to talk Chain about. Chain veil too. Chain and that goes veil, in all of them. Yeah. So if you make all planeswalkers legal, does that mean you need to ban cards like Chain Veil and doubling season? Yeah. And say so, yeah, I don't know, but maybe yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll see. Okay. Because I mean, you do have parallel lives and a bunch of other ways to still do the effect without making planeswalkers broken okay fair enough so i'm arguing against a different person each time i'll keep that in mind pretty much i mean it's impossible man <laughs> yeah, this is so true. hard that's true okay. i have to think of like new stuff for <laughs> each did one job. You did oh, a good job. i'm exhausted over here <laughs> all right let's move on to the next <laughs> section oh god we have like six left <laughs> all right I'll, I'll go a little less hard all right off color fetch lands this is something that jimmy loves and but- i think y'all should love too do you but, want to explain it? Because yeah. yeah, people don't know what that so means. So let's say you're playing a blue and black deck, uh, and you have islands in there and swamps as well. And you'd say, oh, you know what? I want to fetch out this island. I need to use a fetch land. And the fetch land looks for a land type, usually. But you want to use one like Flood Strand that, use, that looks for islands and planes. But your deck isn't playing planes, but the island part of the fetch line can still find it for you. So this is something that is currently legal in Commander because there is no mana symbols on the cards, but this is something that the rules committee has talked about in the past wanting to quote-unquote fix, which is can you use these off-color fetch lands in a deck that doesn't play all the colors that the land itself can fetch? Yeah, they basically have said that they don't feel that that's in the spirit of the format, right? Because a fetch land, although it does not have the mana symbol on it, if it only fetches a island and a planes, it doesn't feel like it should be long in, you know, like a uh, a Demir deck mm-hmm. because it, that doesn't have white in it. And so, but right now, because like you said, color identity is tied to the mana symbol, not the word planes or the word mm-hmm. island. You can uh, notably, it's the fetch land that gets around this restriction because the actual lands that will tap for two colors, those you cannot have in a deck that doesn't play those colors. Right. You unless can't. it's like a mana confluence, which just says tap for one mana of any color. Right. Yeah, you can't have a Tundra in a right. deck that's uh, Demir because it does have the white symbol on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this is something that I'm actually not with the rules committee here and might even desire to get rid of off-color fetches. And why is that, Josh? Uh, I just I, I've decided this person's a little more competitive. Yeah, this competitive. person is like. <laughs> Don't tell me why, Josh. I want to know. <laughs> this person started out agitated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not a good starting place, by the way. If you ever need a debate with someone. Um. I just think that in general, and this kind of is similar to the commander damage thing of like simplicity of rules is mm-hmm. good. Being as close to the rules of other formats in general as possible is good so that somebody, if they play modern, can come over and play commander with, you know, obviously you got to know some things. Right. But, and that was something we didn't talk about in commander damage, which I also think is a downside. But in general, like stuff's going to work the same. Once you know 
oh, my deck has a commander and it has to be the colors of the commander. You know, it's not like... Because it's hard to explain. Somebody, well, you can't use... A fetch land that doesn't have the name of a color that your commander is in. Right, exactly. It's not like it says, go fetch a white land or a black land. It says the name of a, of a land, right? right? Plains or swamp. So I get why they kind of want to for the spirit of the format, quote unquote. But for me, the, again, I'm going to say this phrase probably a lot. It's not like the other side of the arguments has no merit. I think they all do. People mm-hmm. who like commander damage totally get it. People wait, who, wait, you're con- completely underwriting my entire role. <laughs> but keep going, this is but great. But I'm just saying, <laughs> it's it's about the juice being worth the squeeze. Right. It's, to me, the upside and the downside is weighing. It's not like there's only upside on one and there's only downside on the other. There is some upside to getting rid of off-color fetches in that the spirit of, hey, I can only use cards in my deck that are of the colors of the commander, the vorthos side of that works. But to me, the downside is too big. It's just too different than the other formats. Now, my question to you is, what do you think is the spirit of the format? If this is what we think the rules committee was sort of hearkening towards. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, and it's different for everybody. And that's another reason that, you know, I wouldn't want to change it because I don't want to tell somebody who doesn't even think that's the spirit of the format that, right. you know, because someone might say using every card at your disposal was why Commander was invented. Because yeah. you could go through all your old cards and, oh, cool, I can use this fetch land in this deck. It's the only fetch land I actually own. But thank goodness I can use it in this deck because it hasn't been ruled against. Said that person that I may or may not agree with. <laughs> um, no. And other people may just want to be completely like, you can only do color-based things. So I guess, do you want to ever be in a position where you have to police that part of the or have any insight on what that means. Because in a lot of ways, you saying later on, like, I want cards unbanned, is in a way affecting the quote-unquote spirit of the game. Because those cards do may do certain things that either contribute more to games being won and what some people may see as a way that is against the spirit of the game. Sure, and, and spirit of the format is something that's going to be impossible to nail down because every person is going to be different. Uh, and I get that. And I try to make allowances for it when necessary, too. Like not take it as like my perspective on what the format is is Mm -hmm. what it is like i'm constantly talking about cedh and those people and and trying to get rid of the negative rhetoric that a lot of people have about them they're not playing the format wrong they're playing it how they like to play it the Mm -hmm. only thing that's wrong is when you're playing i'm playing with them and they don't let me know or vice versa and then we're not on the same wavelength but as long as everybody knows what everybody's trying to do, then we can at least avoid each other and play in our own little groups or say, oh, I know, in this game, you're going to try and combo out on turn right. four. If, as long as I know that from the start, I'm not going to be mad when it happens, right? This is kind of the thing about Spirit of the Format, too. It's I don't want to dictate to people what the Spirit of the Format is. I just think, if in doubt, let's try and keep the rules as close to the regular rules of, of uh, magic, as, magic possible. as possible, just for simplicity's sake. And, and I do like what you said or what the person that you were talking about said which is yeah that guy that 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 person whoever it was a um, shade of my former self <laughs> that said you know commander is about being able to play with the cards you own and i think that's one of the biggest things about the format is if you have a card and you loved it from the past and were nostalgic about it have a memory of mm-hmm. a tournament you were in with it or whatever for the most part you should be able to play it in our format that's what casuals like playing their cards I open up a box, there's a card in there, I can play it. There you go. So are you saying that if they decided to fix the off-color fetch land thing, it's actually making the game less casual in a lot of ways because now you have to abide by a different world of rules? Maybe. It is, you know, there's the argument of cost too, right? Fetch lands are expensive. Well, that's, why I'm, that, I, that's why the other guy was like, goodness, I only own one. Thank goodness I can play it in this deck. Otherwise, yeah. that would suck. Yeah, but I don't think banning cards based on the cost of the card is necessarily the greatest way to go either. So I I don't know. I don't know the answer to that that part of the question. I don't either. Yeah, I don't know that that factors in exactly for me. Who knows? But again, so your final mm. stance on this is don't change it or don't fix it if it ain't broke kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think let's just keep that as is. All right. All right, moving on now. Hybrid mana. This is an interesting one. So on some cards, you'll see a mana sign that's cut in half, and it has two different colors on it. If it was a Simic one, it would have the green and the blue, which means when you're paying the cost for the spell, you can either pay a green mana or a blue mana. You don't need to pay double. You just can choose which one to pay. So if it had two hybrid mana symbols, you could do green, 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 blue, or blue, blue. Make sense? Now... In the two Ravnica sets that have just come out, there is a bunch of cards with hybrid mana on them because of all the guilds. 
and people have been asking hey in, you know because you can choose to play this spell as two green green why can't i put it in a deck that is mono green and doesn't have blue in it or because i can do two blue blue why can't i play this in my mono blue deck right now it's clarified as being called both colors so you can only play it in decks that have both those colors in it what do you think josh you know i think a lot of this contention comes from the fact that wizards magic r d mark rosewater have said that the intention of hybrid mana was to be either or. Mm -hmm. But the Commander's Rules Committee came out and said that for color identity purposes, it's not either or, it's both. both. And people really want to play some of these cards in decks that don't include both of the colors but only have one of them. I understand that. And this is, I think, one of the most brought up things when I pulled our Discord mm -hmm. and people on Twitter about like, hey, what are the big you know, controversial or contentious changes or fixes, you know, you think Commander needs. Um, a lot of people are like, I wish I could use hybrid, hybrid mana, mana cards. Yeah. Mm. I think that right now the card pool is large enough that the restriction is actually good. It breeds creativity. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need more cards that potentially could go in every deck or every deck that has blue or whatever. And I think I like the fact that there's some really awesome cards that I wish I could play in decks, but I can't. I need both colors. And I actually think that's cool. And I like that as sort of a, these cards, you know, if I'm playing these two colors, that's one of the bonuses I get. And I, and, and I don't, I guess this one, I don't have a super hard stance though. I can see the argument for the other side and I totally get it. Like there's probably a bunch of awesome stuff you could do if you can just take, I don't know, what off the top of my head, I can't think of one, mm -hmm. like Debtor's Nell or something like that, right. and put it only in mono black. You know, that that might be awesome. Immortal Servitude's one that I play in a black-white that shell that I know a lot of Shadowborn Apostles with Shire as the uh, commander would want to put in, but they can't because they don't have white like I do with Athreos, and, and I get that. Um, but for me, I think that the current rule is fine, and again, I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeeze, although this one's closer. Yeah, I would say earlier, you know, you were like, we want to keep this as close to the real rules of magic as possible, right. and this hybrid mana thing is something that the rules community created that's taking us further from it. I don't know that that's true, though, because color identity itself in Commander is a new rule. Mm -hmm. Regular magic doesn't have color identity. But if the original creators were intending to be either or with these, then... Is it sort of like, well, look, if it, if it was supposed to be a strictly green-blue card, then it would have been green and blue, not two hybrid mana symbols of Simic. Right, but then think about like Devoid cards. Mm -hmm. The original creators were trying to make it so that like, yeah, it costs green, but that's a colorless card. But mm -hmm. for the purpose of Commander, that doesn't really work because... It's still a green card. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so I think color identity wasn't something that was ever invented by wizards and was totally invented because they never foresaw a format where like you would restrict mm -hmm. the color of the cards in it based on the card that's in a command zone right so i think that rule is going to be something that people are going to have to wrap their head around when they enter the format no matter what and so hybrid mana well i mean it's a good point it might be a little bit um counterintuitive here's the question i have now because I think it's pretty obvious that if this was to be made legal, that you could use these hybrid mana costs in monocolor decks and just decks that didn't have that color, the other color of the hybrid mana cost, some monocolor decks would really actually benefit benefit from it. White yeah. and red would have access to tools that they normally don't in their color pie. Right, because an in Azorius a, right. hybrid would have some blue, maybe some card draw in it, yeah? No? And in a way, that is breaking the color pie because you're playing a card that shouldn't necessarily be played by that world, if that makes sense. Does that break the spirit of the format? But does it make it better because it makes the monocolor decks versus the fact that when you do do this, you open up some combo potentials as well that could result in a, that's sort of like entering into an experimental frenzy there. Cause you don't exactly know this, right? This is a big, this is a big pile of cards that would be entering. Now is that potential downside of, oh, something may break it's uh, similar to the Planeswalker thing, maybe? It's it's similar, but in this case, it's actually more cards entering the format, so it's more possible ways to break stuff because now you can put the two, you know, a, one of these hybrid cards in a 
different deck that could use that effect to really combo off with something. And then all of a sudden now you're playing with these new card bases in here that originally weren't meant to be with these potentially already self-balanced colors. Right. Um, so is the upside of like, hey, we're going to really help out some monocolors potentially better than the downside of the, oh of my rocking gosh, the boat. who knows? This boat could get really rocked by this. It could get tipped over, you would say? Yeah. Um, see, I think the Planeswalker is a bigger problem because they're commanders. Mm -hmm. And so they will get played every every game multiple times sometimes whereas these will have to go in the 99 they're gonna not have as big an impact naturally by being one of 99 cards but right. at the same time I, I i agree that there is danger there and yeah i i guess this is one where i could maybe possibly be swayed but right now i'm still of the let's not make any sweeping changes because the format is very popular has rocketed to the top of popularity in recent years and why under those circumstances are you going to make huge sweeping changes when it's like you're already winning just keep doing what you were doing it's true we should clarify by the way that of all the things we've talked about really it's only off color fetches that the rules committee has even let people know that they're really discussing internally so this other stuff is mostly community brought up and what we've found is the general tension i mean sheldon's community. on record as saying that he is not in favor of planeswalkers as commanders right and the rules committee has uh been asked many times about the hybrid mana and they've stuck to their guns as far as their previous ruling. So yep. they, they have talked about these things before. Yep. And potentially are still talking about them or they've already made up their mind. Who knows? But let's keep moving on. Feels like they've already made up their mind about hybrid mana. Yeah. <laughs> I think so too. I don't think it's changing anytime soon no. from a Jimmy perspective. It would make things... It would really rock the boat. <laughs> this may rock the boat even further, however. The Unstable Legends... A lot of people want to make these silver-bordered commanders legal in the format, but Josh Lee Kwai, do you think that is a good idea or a bad idea as an official representative of the Rules Committee? I'm not an official representative of the <laughs> Rules Committee. I'm an advisor. Um, I, I agree with the, the people in that I wish that we could have the Unstable Legends minus Spike. Minus Spike. And only the ones from Unstable. Okay. As legal in Commander. That's something I can actually get behind, and the problem is how do you elegantly create a rule that allows it it's it's difficult to because i the last thing i would want to do is like create a legal list right you know and another list as you always say yeah on like top of the other ones the ban list is already a pain in the butt to remember everything right. and to create a second list now that you have to remember like these are the inverse of banned what's the opposite of banned allowed the allowed list I, you may also play these cards as your commander and it lists off Baron Von Count would, and yeah, all the other it guys. It would be sweet because they are cool and I'm sad that we don't get to see them. Here's what should happen. Wizards should just release them as black bordered somewhere, somehow, mm. to make them legal. Just the just the legendary creatures, again, minus Spike, if, if Wizards really wanted to. And then you could play the silver bordered ones. Because they would have been black bordered at some point, right? Yeah, and you can have a foil version of them too that way. Yeah, so okay. that's okay. If what if wizards? And again, the rules committee is not wizards. We, I guess we didn't talk about that at the beginning. And well, we the only person have. that they have is Scott Larrabee, and right? Sort of, they're more like their liaison. I'm just saying, I think it's possible the audience doesn't understand how Commander works because there's right. probably some people out there that think Wizards Makes runs Commander, yeah, the yeah. Commander format. Yeah, Wizards doesn't. They run modern. They run standard. If a card gets banned, that's people at Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. That's their job. And they go and they go, well, let's get rid of these cards and ban them. Commander was created and is run by civilians, by people that are outside of Wizards. Now, they, Wizards has one person, Scott Larry, like you said, on the rules committee, but he's one of four voices. And the other ones have been magic judges and involved with Wizards, but they don't work directly for Wizards. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really unique format in that it's so popular but it's not actually run by Wizards. So Wizards designs cards for a format. This is where most of the of. pains come from too, which is like, we don't really know how it all works. Yeah, maybe, but maybe we will know more soon. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I need you to be my inside man, Josh. Yeah. So take it down from the inside. Not, why take it down? No. Huh? no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I blacked out. What happened? <laughs> that was my sleeper cell persona there. So, but also the rules committee doesn't have the ability to do what I said, right? Which is like, hey, print they can't, these cards. Yeah. Yeah, they can't no go way. to Wizards and be like, print this. And so I'm with everybody. I wish those Unstable Legends could be played, but I'm not sure there's a great way to implement that desire. There is no good way to implement this desire, Josh. Okay. It's called Unstable for a reason. And we don't want to rock this, but we've already <laughs> talked about it. Unstable, it's literally in the name. No, thank you. Moving on. <laughs> 
<laughs> this boat would be unstable. Exactly. That's the last <laughs> thing we need. The format <laughs> is at an all-time high in terms of how great it is. Uh, I do. Jimmy agrees with Josh here. They would be sweet, right? I don't. I've seen them all. I don't think any of them inherently are breaking the format. But at the same time, it's a very tricky wicket. Yeah. If they could release them black bordered just one time somehow, that would make the silver bordered ones. Legal. I wonder even if they could even throw them into like an MTGO esque thing, you know, because they'll occasionally give them away, give cards away in like their little treasure chests and stuff. That's interesting. Would that then make them legal? I don't think it would affect the paper world though. I don't, I don't know. think the rules committee would allow that. Who knows? Because it might change something else somewhere, you know. I don't know. Who uh, knows? Well, yeah. well, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now we are going to talk about competitive EDH, also known as CEDH. Um, and there is a lot of, I think, dissent. This is this is kind of like a contentious part of the EDH community is that there is the, uh, the, the, the competitive groups and there's sort of a bit of negative talk from both sides. I mean, I, I think there's more negative talk from the casuals towards the competitive than vice versa, which is not how you think it would be. But yeah, but maybe it's because, you know, it, I wouldn't say it's it's probably exacerbated by the fact that doing that does not elicit a necessarily great positive response as well. Right. If someone you hear someone down talking you, you're going to jump to the defensive and then things all of a sudden are going to escalate, even if they didn't need to get there in the first place. Right. Right. That's that's a good point. Um, um, but uh you want to take this? I, I don't really know too much about this outside of, I guess it's true though, competitive EDH is not really represented or spoken for by the rules committee. What do you think should happen, if anything? So one of the big things, again, when this announcement was made is a lot of people who are interested in competitive EDH saw me and I think Rachel, who has um, written about competitive EDH before, as sort of their great hope of like finally having a voice. And they're using me. They would be sorely disappointed. <laughs> Well, it's funny. It shows how desperate they are that they're pointing at me because I'm not a competitive EDH player. Right. I've said it many times. But at the same time, I'm... You're the spikier side of well, things. Well, I'm, I'm receptive. Right? I will talk. I will just mention CEDH even though I don't play it. I, I don't know all those decks. I've read about it for episodes and things like that. And I've yeah. talked to people who do play competitive EDH. So I have like the vaguest idea of what's going on with it. But at the same time, I'm on record just being... Um, what's the word? sympathetic to the fact that that's the way they like to play and they should like to play it that way and that's totally fine i'm with you and so they're like that desperate that they're like josh he's gonna be our guy that's gonna stick up for us in the rules committee which i will try to at least bring up that perspective but i also don't think that competitive edh can or should govern how edh as a whole mm -hmm. is run because a lot of what i heard and this is a big alarm bells are ringing moment from the competitive people when they came to me when they heard about this was all the cards they want to have banned. If you've got uh, a long list of cards that you want to have banned, you're talking to the wrong person, and I think you're in the wrong format. Not not that you shouldn't play c Commander, remember? but Commander's just never going to be a format where they ban right. 100 cards. Right. Because Commander can't be balanced in that way, but the competitive people want it to be tournament balanced. Right. Well, the competitive people are seeing it from we have now made the top tier decks. We understand what the quote unquote competitive meta is. What the problem cards are. What the problem cards are. And in order to make this a better balanced meta for us, this is what we need to do. I think, and now I'm just out of the devil's advocate role here, you should probably just break off into your own format that takes some, most of its cues from EDH. But if you need to govern it in such a harsh way, that's only affecting, I don't know, 5% of the player base? Ten, I don't even know what the percentage is. We're just making up numbers, but it's, it's hard small. for you to take that 5% over the 95 and say, these cards need to get banned because we're specifically in a play group that knows how to abuse them in a way that's making it unfun for our specifically strictly competitive format of playing this. I believe Stuff. that following a line where we ban a bunch of cards for balance reasons like that actually hurts commander to the point where it's no longer as popular as it is right i mean they already have dual commander there's already these things like canadian highlander like other french singleton one formats one french one view yeah yeah that that have their ban lists that are, are separate from the regular ban list so interesting but i do think that competitive people have a perspective that is useful and and should be at least considered and taken into an account so i do too i think that's the thing that i would encourage you to go after most which is like what does what do you think competitive play brings to EDH in a way that should enlighten or at least throw some light on the rest of this mass of what is commander and how do we make it the best? Yeah, yeah. 
That's um, a question we should be asking. Yeah. So all you CEDH people out there, I am willing to hear your perspective, and I've heard from a bunch of you already, but specifically like banning a bunch of cards, mm-hmm. not something I'm ever going to advocate for. Maybe there are other changes, though, that I would listen to. Maybe, you know, like I said, the hybrid mm-hmm. mana thing is a thing where I'm lukewarm about my own uh, position on it. Like, I, yeah. I do feel like it should stay as it is, but I don't feel like I'm... Th- that's not a hill I'm willing to die on. <laughs> I would, you know, the thing that's valuable for me from CEDH is the way that that group plays can be considered the most unfun way to play. Right, but to they have so fun. many other people, but they have fun doing it. So the question is: Is there any insight that they can shed in terms of like why it is fun for them, but also why they understand why it's not fun for other people, and if there's a balance between the two that can lend some of that. Or is it strictly just a competitive nature thing that makes them enjoy CEDH that much more than regular EDH? And is that something that's just not bred into your, like, let's just take your your average commander player. Do they have that? Do they need to have that to have more fun? Or is it actually better that they don't have that in them? All right, well, hard question to answer. I'd love to hear everybody's perspective. All right. Um, all right, well, Ooh. speaking of banning a bunch of cards. This is your favorite subject now. Everyone wants to know, Josh, what cards, if you could, if you wanted to, would you recommend being banned in the format? Yeah, this is the number one question I got. Should, should we ban Cyclonic Rift, Josh? Can you tell them to ban Cyclonic Rift? Please. How about Dead Eye? Dead Eye never gonna win so many games. Oh, Paradox Engine. It's Paradox Engine good. Uh. <laughs> Soul Ring, Mana Crypt. I can't afford a Mana Crypt. Those guys with Mana Crypt, it's so stupid. That book promo, whatever, like it's still dumb. They have so much mana and then the, the damage is inconsequential because they have 40 life. So what's the point? And then they're just ramping up bigger spells and they're just killing me with it. That's not cool. Yeah, I'm not in favor of banning anything if possible i'm not saying there would never be a card that i'm i think hey that should be banned but in general um i won't be advocating for bans but josh it ruins the format how many games you say you didn't want games to go long right right cyclonic crypt probably the greatest go longer game card in the format ah i disagree i think it ends a lot of games i've seen it make a game go on for two hours longer because everyone could reset and the person couldn't capitalize on it i know not everyone's you josh when they cast that big spell they're going to win off it a lot of people just do it because they have to save their own lives and then they're at a disadvantage position and then the game just takes even longer okay but i mean you you can at least make arguments of the games where people cyclonic rift on the end set before their turn and then win and so those probably balance out in my at the very least in my estimation uh based on my personal experience i don't see this to be the case i see that cyclonic rift is often used as a protection spell if anything to be I like think it can be so that's why bad it's so good i gotta do it but a lot of times it's just like nope i'm just gonna use it to bounce everything so only i have stuff and nobody else does i see dead eye i don't see as a huge problem um anymore they've you know it's good it's really good don't get me wrong it's super powerful but you have to combo it with something okay what about zero mana rocks or or like the grim monolith they're so expensive they they make things so explosive and sure you can have artifact removal but if you just have these cards in the format sometimes it just leads to these awful feel bads where i can't do anything versus a deck that ramps green land-based ramp i think is more powerful than that stuff most of the time yeah and but when it comes to have... comboing off green land based ramp is holds nothing to true, your grim true, monolith true. on tapping it competitive edh players play a lot more grim monolith probably than they play and man of sky Vaults, right? claims or whatever right. yeah um but also i don't think there's a good realistic way to just ban all that stuff right like how does that work do you go soul ring mana crypt mana vault like how do you where do you stop and mm-hmm. how do you, like really we're gonna just ban like 10 cards at once what about cards like Crater Hoof Behemoth? Things that just win the game no matter what. I mean, Crater Hoof has to be set up, so I don't even think that's even close to. How about on expropriate, the list. Josh? That you said you've never seen that card lose a game. Oh well, one time now I lost with it when I cast it, so I'm no longer undefeated. I haven't cast it. I'm like twelve and one, but that's got to be overpowered. That's Surely just, that that's should just be me. I don't think I've actually banned. seen anybody else lose when they've cast it either. <laughs> when they've cast it there. Um, well, expropriate specifically. Here's the thing. I think if the format tries to say we can't allow any spells that cost eight nine ten mana and then win the game then that list of cards tooth and nails and you know omnisciences and things like that is too big and so you know expropriate's not that different than tooth and nail if you want to tooth and Mm -hmm. nail will win you the game when you cast it and so i think that we just have to say there are going to be some spells that cost eight nine ten mana and they're going to have a very high chance to win the game when they're played and that's okay. And if people want to play those, we got to let them because we can't ban 20 cards. 
So you're saying there is not a single card right now that you would recommend be banned from the format? No. All right. Moving on. So, yeah, I, I, I would much rather unban things than ban things. All right. Would, yeah. Unbans. Yeah. So what would you unban if you had the choice, Josh? Okay. So I'm not saying I would unban all of these, but these are the ones I think are in contention to be unbanned. Biorhythm. Mm -hmm. That one I actually think I would unban. We have it on a stick already. And it fits the criteria I just stated, which are eight, nine, ten mana spell that can win the game. Biorhythm won't always win the game. It requires some setup. But can it? Yeah. But are... I think we just have to be okay with spells that cost that amount that can win the game sometimes. We already have them. Expropriate is already... Right. Actually, I think Expropriate's better than Biorhythm. You don't have to set it up. You just cast it and you will win most of the time. Biorhythm, you probably have to do some stuff to win right then with it. Right. Um, Reoccurring Nightmare, I think, is a possibility. Coalition Victory. Painter's Servant. Oh, please. World Fire. Sway the Stars. Maybe Panoptic Mirror. Those are the ones that come to mind uh, right away as ones I would take a look at and think about unbanning. Right. Probably wouldn't unban all of them, but I think a couple of those could come off. And, and getting a lean and mean ban list that has less things on it, I think it'd be good. And maybe it would open up um, you know, future bannings, even though I don't really want to do that. But mm -hmm. there are cards that are way worse than all the cards I just named. Well, I would say, remember when Braids was banned and Koku yeah. Show was banned? Yeah. Sometimes I feel like these bans may have been made at a time when things were a little less refined. Kokusha was banned at some point. Isn't that yeah, crazy? that's crazy. That's crazy. That card is nowhere near powerful enough to be banned. No. Yeah. But the effect, I can see it being like, oh, man, that thing just keeps taking games. That's absurd. That's crazy. All you need is a sack. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Especially if it recur with like a recurring nightmare-esque effect. Yeah. I mean, it's a great card. Don't get me wrong. I just think that like, that's a really good point. I think the point you were making was that the format evolves and as new cards are added in, a lot of old cards just don't have the power that they used right. to. And I think a lot of these, you know, like Worldfire, that's not a fun card. Mm -hmm. But it costs a million mana, and yeah, it will win you the game most of the time when you cast it, but it's how different is it than Expropriate, really? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Sway the Stars, too. Like, another card that's, like, <laughs> annoying, but costs a million mana. Coalition Victory. Please unban it. I just want to have one Coalition Victory. That'd be fun. It's really not even going to affect that much. You have to be in a five-color deck. Yeah, yeah. First of all, just that right alone, I think, makes it like totally fine. Because if you have to be in a five color deck to even play the card, then it's just not going to have that big of an effect on the format. Oh, my the power, you win the game. <laughs> it's, it's hard to argue against a lot of these unbans, knowing that the ban list has been a bit antiquated at times. And there's a, a, there's people being like, well, if reoccurring, you could do this and this and this. But tell me, is that so much worse than the stuff that's already going on? That right. The, the it's like, oh, you know what other three mana green card that ruins things like Yisan. Yeah. That or like food way more powerful. Food, food chain. chain. Like tell me why food chain's not banned if some of this stuff is. Because food chain is more of a combo enabler than any of the cards that I just talked about. Panager Servant maybe not. Yeah. That might be the only real one there. Yeah, I agree. Panager Servant seems like it would just do more fun stuff. And if you want to be broken, you can already be broken. It's I think the problem hard. with Painter Servant is that it would just go into so many decks that would love to have it that that price, that card would be like 100 bucks in like a day. Well, I, swear. I don't think, again, I don't think we can make bands and stuff based on like the cost of the cards. It's no, just, no, I know. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just saying that's one card that I could see so many people being like, yep, it's just not to include now. It's definitely combo-y, but at the same time, like it's not, I don't think it's more powerful than Paradox Engine. It might be Paradox Engine good though uh yeah we gotta make a shirt yeah the shirt just says this shirt is paradox, paradox engine, engine good. Level good yeah <laughs> paradox engine good let us know if you'd buy that shirt because if if enough people say yes then maybe yeah. we'll design and one we'll work on the copy so yeah. it's we'll figure out the spacing and everything <laughs> all right um i want to say because we're going to wrap up here that it's first of all it's an honor to be um you know selected to be on the commander advisory group but i want you all to know that my biggest sort of platform or my biggest stance is going to be make as little changes as possible i don't think sweeping changes are necessary the format is not in trouble mm -hmm. it's not like a person coming into a company where it's failing and you know <laughs> got to slash you know payroll and make sweeping changes we're in the opposite situation the business is booming yeah the 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 format is thriving so for me mostly let's keep going in the same direction that we're going. There's no reason to make really big changes. 
Keep evolving, never stop changing. Changes are necessary, Josh. Right, right. And I think that's true, but I just don't think big ones are, for the sake of it, are, are good. Like oh. Big changes <laughs> are coming to this podcast. Okay, to the listeners, <laughs> this is maybe our one of our more important to the listeners ever. Yeah. What do you think about the issues we talked about today, or are there other things you believe are even bigger changes or fixes that Commander needs that we didn't even talk about? We'll be reading these comments closely, and uh, so there's a chance that you could actually, you know, if you if you make a statement or a, a, the case for something, and I, yeah, and and Jimmy and I are like, wow, that's really interesting. I will, I would say there's an outside chance that it's like, oh, I'll, I'll bring that up with the rules committee. So, yeah. and a very direct way to get at this again at the two dollar level on our Patreon, you can get on our Discord where we had the initial discussion for this, um, and also a lot of other really great minds in there talking about this stuff too, so you can share your thoughts and get some feedback as well. Yeah, we all love this format, and we all want the best for it, and so I know that's. The true of all of you out there even if you disagree with us and i think you know hearing perspectives from everybody is good yeah we all love this format and i also want what's best for your card collection that's right if you want to get a hold of reoccurring nightmare or byron they're they're banned by the way don't get those cards cyclonic and, and, and the reality is that i have no actual power to unban those <laughs> things so don't think that just because josh mentioned it, it's going to get unbanned we're going to unban them for one second ready <laughs> and go that was it all right it's banned again <laughs> but yes cyclonic rift dead eye navigator uh what were the other ones paradox engine oh yeah go all to, these good cards go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone you're going to buy magic cards anyway you're going to build decks you're going to build your prime speaker vanifar stuff you're going to order your ravnica allegiance oh yeah if you just use our affiliate link when you do that stuff, you are helping this podcast stick around, game nights, extra turns, all of our content. Yep. And of course, Ultra Pro is our other sponsor of the show. Make sure to pick up some Ultra Pro products next time you are at a local game store or even at Card Kingdom. Or hey, you know what? If you're thinking about buying some new sleeves, lots of great colors in the Eclipse sleeves. You know, the um, orange and the yellow ones, those are my favorite. You've got the Black Lotus playmat right here. Yes. And they have matching Black Lotus sleeves, deck boxes, oh. and dice bags even that I've seen out there. There's even a wall Amazing. scroll that we have. Uh, so Black Lotus stuff, That's it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. I just got to say. I mean, Christopher Rush, rest in peace, man. I love this art. Yeah. Many many uh, people who don't even play Magic, they know what the Black Lotus is. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Someone who was like, I had a card. My daughter had a card once. I need to look for it. I think it was the Black Lotus. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think it was. Yeah, because <laughs> if but it was, hey, that was a college education. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the answer where we talk about something cool outside of the world of Magic. And this week, oh, boy, we are on fire. Yes. Because there have been two documentaries posted about the Fire Festival, which was... F-Y-R-E. F-Y-R-E, that's right. This was hyped to be the greatest single Party. private beach private island expansive artists the best private party in party. the history of the world yes with amazing models instagram opportunities around every corner private cabanas tents blink 182 blink 182 all sorts of artists i like how blink 182 makes that list <laughs> they were at the top of <laughs> yeah, all the buildings um, turns out it was one of the greatest and largest debacles. large scale debacles and frauds of consumers ever and it was documented in a uh, documentary called Fire on Netflix. And then uh, Hulu decided that they needed to jump on it and rushed out their own documentary called Fire Fraud. Yeah, I've only seen the Netflix one. Yes, I have also only seen the Netflix Netflix one. Full disclosure, my friend edited the Netflix one, yeah. John Carmen. Uh, uh, my friend as well, he used to work at Rocket Jump. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. we, uh, I found out some very interesting details about why the other... It's interesting, in this whole thing about getting the truth out about something, someone else kind of wanted to jump. It's very similar to what the story is about. Someone else wanted to take an opportunity and release another, Netflix, or another uh, documentary ahead of it, uh, and that was Hulu. Mm -hmm. Well... Regardless of that, I think the Netflix doc is, it was super entertaining and very interesting. Very much so. And like this weird train wreck that you just can't stop looking can't at. Can't stop watching. And was, everyone knew it, but the owner, Billy, was so in denial and such a psychopath yeah. that he just let it happen and they, all these people got screwed. They basically were going to throw this party on this island in the Bahamas and they had never done anything like this. So the logistics of like setting up the stages and having, you know, travel and lodging and everything Safety, for all the water, people. water, plumbing, everything. Uh, bathrooms, food, everything was like, they sold uh, like 6,000 tickets or something. They sold 90% like, of their tickets in the yeah. first 24 hours. Some of these tickets cost upwards of like $8,000 a piece for these private cabanas and ex like all these things that people were promised. And you just get to watch it be a train wreck in slow motion as they realize that they had no time to do it. 
He they had no experience doing no it. Experience they didn't know how it. to do any of it. They basically had sold an idea that they had no ability to fulfill. Yeah. So it was, it's super crazy. So highly, highly recommend that you check out Fire, yeah. F-Y-R-E on Netflix. It's really interesting. Yeah. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, which one's the better documentary? Yada, yada, yada. Fun fact, Fire Fraud. So Fire worked with a uh, the social media company that did all of this stuff for Fire. Their name is F. Jerry, but the F is the actual swear word. Um, and the Fire Festival documentary on Netflix worked with this social media team. So a lot of people were saying, oh, they're biased, they're this and that. But actually, because of that, they had access to a lot of behind-the-scenes footage, raw footage, stuff shot throughout the entire process. And the Fire Fraud documentary, people were saying, is quote-unquote more legit because they actually get to interview the uh, the guy, Billy. Mm -hmm. Little known fact, they had to pay an exorbitant amount of money exorbitant 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 amount of money to get billy to interview on the fire festival documentary on hulu a money that billy also requested from the netflix team which they flat out denied after knowing how much of a piece of work he piece is. of work he is <laughs> so very interesting to see it's great you should definitely watch i mean hey watch both i'm gonna watch the hulu one as well just to see what perspective they tell um i think the fire uh, one on netflix is much more focused on the individual stories of the people that got messed up by Billy, and so this is sort of them getting a chance to finally speak out and tell the world what really happened. So I think that's really fascinating. Also, the fact that they had, because when they did the Fire Festival, they were like shooting all the behind the scenes stuff, thinking that it was going to be great promotional material yeah. for the festival. But as it starts to like creep along and they realize like, we're eight weeks away, yeah. but we don't even have all the talent booked and we don't even know how to build a stage we a and stage. We, don't we don't actually have a, have a place for yeah. people to sleep. And it, so it starts going downhill, but they've the people who are shooting the behind the scenes stuff are still around in the room shooting the stuff. And so it's pretty crazy to just have that kind of footage and access for such a train wreck. Yeah. Normally people would be like, okay, we don't want to document all this stuff, but because of the way it went down, they did. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's all Check there. It out. It's fascinating. Yep. Something else that's fascinating are our good friends, Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. Well, not them. So I mean, they're they're mildly fascinating. But their show, <laughs> The Masters of Modern, now that it's is masterful. fascinating. Yes. Uh, they are a podcast about the modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find them on YouTube if you just type in Masters of Modern. They do video now. You can also find them uh, at collected.company right next to us. And on Twitter, they are at the MMCast. And I think they'll probably have some stuff to say as well because Clark Cruck Iron Cruck Clan, Clan, Clan Ironworks. KCI. Gosh, KCI got banned in modern Big after deal. putting up a incredibly strong showing decks wise at the uh, at some GPs as well. Yep. Cruck Clan Ironworks. Yeah, you can say it. Ugh, it's so hard. I'm just glad it's gonna be cheaper now so I can put it more in my deck. That's true. EDH. It's great for us commander players because that card is broken. Oh, it's shut up yeah. afterwards. It's Ashnod's Altar, but for artifacts, essentially. Yeah. All right, and our editor for the show is Josh Murphy. Murph. Murph. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living card animations that feature at the beginning and end of the video show, as well as behind us here at the lovely Command Zone Podcast Studios here in California. In sunny, sunny California. California. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>